Lift up your voice in song to the Mighty One. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the rock that stands. Glory and honor and power be unto the Lamb. Lift up your voice in song to the Mighty One. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. Jesus Christ is Lord. At the name of Jesus, every knee must bend, every tongue proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. Welcome, brothers and sisters. I'm Father Al Lauer, and this is Daily Bread. And we're going to bring up a subject that I think could really make a big difference in a person's life. And we're talking especially to married couples. And the subject is, what about oral sex prior to the regular sex? Now, this is something hardly anybody talks about, and, but it's something that is affecting many people's lives and many people's marriages. And we're going to bring up this in a little bit more detail and why we're doing this and all this. So anyway, we need to pray, uh, brothers and sisters, I get ready to give this teaching. And this has been a teaching that's been, um, I guess you'd say there's a lot of, um, of warfare around it, you might say. I wrote this article uh, in, in the June 1995 issue of My People, Christian Newspaper. And of all the articles that we've had there for nine years, I would say, at least as far as I could tell, this had the greatest number of responses. And in fact, the responses were at the extremes. We had several people say, I knew that what you said was right for years, but nobody would affirm me. I was left with no pastoral guidance. Thank you. Thank you for telling me the truth. Thank you for giving me something by which I can try to bring some order and some deeper love into my marriage. And then, of course, we had some other extreme reactions. And, in fact, one person actually uh, called me up, an anonymous person, as you might have guessed, and, and actually threatened to uh, do violence to me because of this article. Others didn't quite go that far, but they uh, were very, um, I guess you'd say, uncharitable and even belligerent in their comments. So the, the title of the article was Oral Sex in Marriage, and um, this is really, a, a surprisingly to me, a very volatile subject. I'm going to start off before we pray, reading from Mark in chapter 6. And verse 18, John the baptizer told Herod, who was uh, doing something much different than what we're talking about, but I, this is about the only time, uh, well, one of the few times I've ever really felt like John the baptizer here. Well, John the baptizer told Herod, it is not right for you to live with your brother's wife. Now, that's a definite, obvious sin. I'm not saying it's the same thing as oral sex as part of foreplay, but I am saying that when I have said it is not right, gosh, you know, you think people want your head, and at least some people do. Well, let's pray right now. Lord, we ask that we would be pure as you are pure. We pray especially for married couples to be chaste. We pray for marital chastity in Jesus' name. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, why have people um, 
um, I don't know, I guess you'd say, been upset about me bringing this subject up, oral sex in marriage prior to the regular sexual relations. Well, why? Well, one good reason and, uh, is that the Catholic Church gives no authoritative teaching on this subject. But the Catholic Church has never maintained it gives authoritative teaching on every subject. And just because it doesn't give authoritative teaching on a subject doesn't mean there is no truth involved in that subject or you can do anything you feel like. It means that you have to follow your conscience and that means that you have to be given the information in order to have a well-informed conscience. So what people have said, if the Catholic Church doesn't say anything officially on this, there are some moral theologians who say that sexual, uh, oral sex before regular sexual relations, that's okay as long as it all ends in regular sexual relations. Um, well, just because uh, that, that gives you some help in forming your conscience, but um, I think um, there's not anything giving the cons with the pros, at least not that I know of. And even these few more theologians who say something about this, well, do they, is anybody really know about that much? The, most people are, are left pastorless. They're, they're left without any direction. And in our society where formed consciences are, well, excuse me, well-formed consciences are somewhat rare. We're dominated by a culture of death where we live in, in idolatry to sexual experience. Uh, obviously, we really need some pastoring here. Now, I'm not blaming the church because obviously the church cannot give some sort of guidance on everything. But I'm saying somebody needs to do some sort of pastoring here instead of just ignore it and then say, form your consciences with no help. With no help on this matter in an area where people would probably need a lot of help because of the perversions of our society. So there, I understand that if a Catholic church doesn't say uh, an authoritative teaching on that, you can't say that this is what you have to do and this is the truth, period. You can say, it's the truth, but uh, I can't, I can't um, def definitely say that. I can say, I believe it's the truth, and there is such a thing as truth here, but there's no authoritative statement on it, okay? But just because there's no authoritative statement, you gotta, you'll be living your lives. You've got the various temptations. Uh, so somebody's got to do something. And um, so we, I feel that despite the fact that we cannot say this is the truth authoritatively, we can say it's the truth. We can say uh, there is truth whether there's authoritative statement on it or not. But the fact that we can't say it authoritatively in one way means we need to say it even more than ever because people are given less help because of the lack of authoritative statements in this area. So anyway, that's one of the reasons for not bringing it up and which I believe is a reason for bringing it up. Now, I, I would say one of the main reasons to bring it up and, uh, is because I've just talked in 21 years as a priest to many married couples and it seemed to me that oral sex was a part of the deterioration of their marriage. Uh, and... Um, how could you say, well, how, what do you know? Well, how would you know? You haven't involved in any kind of sexual relations. You're a celibate. How do you know all this stuff? Well, I just talked to a lot of people. And I talked to people about, about their personal matters. And, um, and so I need to learn from that. I need to learn how to help people. I need to learn how to pastor. And, you know, you go and tell people whose marriages are falling apart, you shouldn't get a divorce. And if you do get a divorce, you shouldn't be remarried. And, and, but, but then what about all this stuff beforehand? What about all the years where the marriage is being sabotaged or destroyed or eroded? Uh, what, what about that? Shouldn't we do something for those people? 
Now, of course, if you say oral sex uh, just always is wonderful for a marriage, it never has any bad effects, well, then why bring it up? Well, of course we shouldn't bring it up. But all I can say is I've talked to a lot of people, and that's not been their experience. Not at all. And so I don't think we can just sit by and um, not really deal with some of the circumstances involved in the deterioration of marriages all around us. We've got to do something. So that's what we're going to try to do to some extent. So as you could probably tell, um, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that oral sex as foreplay is wrong. I can't say that authoritatively, but I can say that uh, pastorally. I can say that for love of married couples, that we want them to have the marriages God wants them to have. And we don't want any kind of um, uh, ignorance or uh, sinfulness to ruin that. Now, two reasons that I would like to give at least two main reasons why oral sex as foreplay is not right. One is it's obviously not natural. It is contrary to the natural law. And um, most people, even if they don't believe in a natural law, they do believe in a natural law. They just don't believe in some natural laws. It, I think most people would agree that, uh, that oral sex is not natural. Now, um, if they say, well, yeah, but natural law is not the main point. Well, does that mean anal sex then is okay? How about nasal sex? Uh, we we'll say, well, that's crazy. How can you say it's crazy um, if there's no natural law? Do you, do, you, do you see what I mean? So most people, I think, agree uh, that there is such a thing as natural law. They don't agree to the extent that it should be interpreted. And once we say, well, I think we can make an exception for natural law with oral sex as foreplay, well then of course homosexuals would say, I think we can make some more exceptions about natural law. Uh, well, anyway, you get the idea. Sometimes uh, the, the, the principle that is um, used to, I guess you'd say, make exceptions to natural law is um, as long as it leads to the natural, it's okay for it to be unnatural. Uh, some priests and counselors, I think, have given that advice to married couples over the years, which is a really uh, far off the wall, to put it mildly. Basically, it, it, it kind of like says, anything goes if you're married and it ends in vaginal sex. Well, that doesn't make too much sense. Now, some people apply that not only by having oral sex as foreplay, but by having pornographic movies as foreplay, which is, which is, of course, quite unnatural in themselves. If you know anything about pornography, it's not just a natural attraction to the opposite sex. It's an unnatural, perverted uh, way of operating. Uh, so is, is that all right, some pornography before, before sex? How about... How about, uh, this happens often in marriages, at least I've been told. How about uh, some sort of fantasizing where you're having sex with your wife, but you're really uh, fantasizing some other person. Is that good? Is that really the giving of oneself? Now, of course, some people would say, that's a good point about this giving of oneself because that is the essence of true marital sexuality. And... Uh, there is love sometimes in oral sex. Now, I can't argue with that completely. I think sometimes a person is not very happy with this uh, form of sexual stimulation, and they, they do it um, basically out of um, love for the other person. I would say that uh, there, there is some giving of oneself. But remember, the giving of oneself and love must be based on truth. You just don't, even if you have good intentions, you don't do something that's immoral. Uh, in that case, you could make a, a case for uh, homosexual uh, sexual relations. 
because you could say probably some homosexual relations, at least on the part of one of the people or maybe two, is a sincere attempt to give themselves to the other person. But it's not based on truth. And, and so even though there could be a, a sincere attempt to love, love cannot be divorced from truth. And so even though there could be some sincere attempts of, to love in oral sex as foreplay, is, is that based on truth? Certainly not based on natural law. What truth is it based on? Well, well say what's well, based on a psychological sense of giving. Well, yeah, but what if you divorce the psychological from the biological? Is the psychological anything other than our own self-deception? You know, there, there has to be truth is not just what you think. It has to have some factual basis. Where's the factual basis for oral sex as foreplay? Where is that? Now, of course, some people will go on and say, well, the emphasis is really not on the oral sex. The emphasis is on the um, regular vaginal sex. And all this is is a help towards that. Now, um, the problem there is, uh, why do you need help for this, for regular sex? Why would that uh, need extra stimulation? Say, well, because I'm, I'm getting old. Well, does God say you need to help that situation? Uh, maybe you're getting old is, um, is a sign that things need to change in your sexual relations. And uh, this is really not s dealing with the real problem, which is so often the case in our society. We uh, seem to want to work around it. As you probably can guess, uh, a lack of sexual urge or drive for a, a married party um, is um, there's some reason for that, and and uh, that reason shouldn't be ignored or got around by some other means. Is it po is it good for uh, if if this oral sex as a stimulant towards regular sex, would that mean it would be good to take some sort of pills to deal with that? Some sort of hormones to deal with that? Well, I, I don't think that's necessarily the answer. Um, what it, it seems like it's not dealing with the real cause. Many times I've talked to couples in these situations and said, uh, did you ever pray? Say, no, we don't really pray together. Uh, but did you ever put your sexual relations under the Lordship of Jesus and just kind of see what He would want? Um, is there any possible resentment that uh, may be involved in this and it started, is affecting your sexual drive? Is there um, um, maybe uh, sexual relations outside of marriage or before marriage? According to 1 Corinthians 6, there's a bonding of people when there's sexual relations. And that is not only in marriage, and maybe that, that sexual bonding is interfering with the normal sexual relations. Of course, a lot of people have vasectomies and tubal ligations, and that is, I guess you would call it, a ecological a sexual catastrophe. You were not made to have your tubes tied. God would have tied them if he wanted them that way. You were not made to have a vasectomy. And then once you do that, once you make that change, you've changed everything. You've changed your whole ecological system and now things are way off. And so I've seen the case where people have had vasectomies and then a few months or years after vasectomy, there where they move into oral sex as a foreplay in order to kind of have more of a sexual drive. Well, see, they're not really dealing with the original problem. They're trying to uh, do some sort of compensation for the wrong approach 
to the original problem, which is just adding more problems, and the whole thing is getting more and more out of whack. And then uh, here you have a vasectomy. The whole nature of sexual relations has changed. The whole dynamics has changed. The whole love has changed. Changed quite dramatically because of this self-mutilation. And, and they're, they're, instead of dealing with this whole problem, which is basically repent and try to bring some order back into your sexual relations, uh, possibly even try to get a reversal, uh, instead of dealing with that, you end up um, saying, well, we'll try to get around this problem, one of the effects of this problem, a, a lessening of sexual drive, and what we'll do is have oral sex as foreplay. Now you're just throwing another mess to try to compensate for the results of your, your last catastrophe. And, and things are getting out of whack. Now you do that, and, the, and your spouse uh, rightly um, feels somewhat resentful. And, uh, and so that's a new element brought into the situation. Of course, that resentment does have some effect on you. You might be resentful because he's resentful or she's resentful. And so now there's a double resentment. And, of course, that's not going to improve the sexual desire or at least direct it in the right way. So that's off. And, oh, gosh, what, what's happening here is just making matters worse to make matters worse. What's the motivation behind oral sex as foreplay? What's the motivation? Now, as I said before, in some cases it could be a motivation of love, especially when you, the one party says, I'm not really into this, but I'll do it if the other one really thinks it's that important. Um, but it's a love not based on truth. And then um, you... Most of the time, though, the motivation would be lust. Or the motivation would be trying to deal with the problem without dealing with the problem. Basically, dealing with an effect of the problem in order to avoid the real cause of the issue. Uh, so, uh, the motivation is uh, often off. I wouldn't say it's always off, but I, w I believe it's always off for at least one party in the marriage, one of the two in the marriage. Um, and uh, sometimes it's off for both of them. I think as time goes on, it gets off. And um, it, it just impresses me so much uh, some of the married couples that I've talked to especially when they come to me, not with their spouse, but just on their own. And they, uh, they basically um, say, uh, all the priests I've talked to said the church doesn't say anything on this, so it must be right. Of course, that's a wrong conclusion. Because just because the church doesn't say something on something doesn't mean it's right. It just means it never said anything. We don't know if it's right or wrong authoritatively. We have to do come to that conclusion through our, our own well-informed conscience. So to say, if a church doesn't say it's wrong, then it's okay. No. If a church doesn't say it's wrong, then we don't know if it's wrong, or we also don't know if it's right. So people who have had no help from the church and no help from pastors, if anything, confusion, and they've been told a completely wrong conclusion, they come and said, even though this priest told me it was okay because it wasn't wrong, but just because it's wrong doesn't mean it's okay. Just because it's not wrong clearly doesn't mean it's okay. Well, then I, um, I went ahead and did it, but I don't know. I just can't just, I just can't uh, be at peace with it. You say, well, that just shows you the prudishness of a lot of people in our society. Brothers and sisters, I'll tell you, a lot of these people that I've talked to, they are not prudish one bit. In, in our society, prudishness is, in, is not um, one of the uh, things that are very, that's, that's that dominant, at least uh, is getting very, very less a part of our society. These people uh, just have a sensitivity 
to what's going on inside of them. They have a sensitivity to their personal dignity. They have a sensitivity to the nature of marital love. And that's why they are uh, uncomfortable, they would say, about these whole things. Well, let me conclude with a couple of scriptures. One is Tobit in chapter 8, verse 7. Tobias says, Now, Lord, you know that I take this wife of mine not because of lust, but for a noble purpose. Brothers and sisters, when you have oral sex uh, prior to regular sex, if you would, can you say that this is for a noble purpose? Well, okay, another one, this is Galatians in chapter 5. And verse uh, 8, if he sows in the field of the flesh, he will reap a harvest of corruption. But if his seed ground is the spirit, he will reap everlasting life. So you reap not only what you sow, you reap where you sow. And is are you sowing in the field of the flesh? If so, you will reap corruption. I've seen so many marriages reap corruption. Okay, brothers and sisters, I've, I've told you what I feel is necessary pastorally. We don't want to leave you out in the dark. We don't want to leave you to fend for yourself with no help. We want your marriage protected. We don't want any insidious attacks of the evil one, the flesh of the world, to mess up your marriage. So please take these things to heart and be pure as Jesus is pure. Remember, marriage is not a license for impurity with one person. It is a call to love in a special way with one person. Let's pray. Lord, we pray for marriages to be pure, marriages to be faithful, marriages to be total self-giving and true love. We pray all this in Jesus' name. May Almighty God bless you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the rock that stands. Glory and honor and power be unto the Lamb. Lift up your voice in song to the Mighty One.